I miss Malaprops so much. Um, yeah, I just remember Warren Wilson times just spending whole days there um, in the cafe. Um, so I kind of half planned my reading. I'm going to, I'll start with um, this poem uh, titled Blood Harmony. And um, I wrote it after a scene from the uh, Rene Fassbender uh, movie, Corel, based on the Jean Genet novel, um, but a particular scene. Um, yeah, so Blood Harmony. This will be anything but beautiful. Blade buried in us bloodshed, or rather the need for it in all the ways we, I'm told, should crave love too. To loathe heir of my father's blood is the matter of sentience. I know I am meant to love you, yet can the salt of our blood serum be the elixir to break this fever of rage, this kissing of fists? Are we not at war over my body, its dominion, which men may stroke my arm and which cannot. Here is my mouth. Give me the sweet ache of your knuckles. Let's unravel our mouths in the most dangerous song of fraternity. Fill our ears with nothing except each other with scales for which our bodies together are the only capable instrument, a fine instrument of brutality, a double-minded man of muscled rage, reluctant tenderness. We dance around that which we are only brave enough to signal with our blades short and bright lyric Skilled as we are in the blood bother of this evasion, we mean only to stifle the air of one another momentarily, to be sensed as if we matter to the other, to be reviled, only to be revealed, at last relieved of this anger's load. Now we have locked hands, joined is your right to my left, do we mean to harm with this one fist? It kisses no mouth. It promises only to break open our desire to be touched and consoled in a way only a brother's hand can. Brought here by the blood deed of brothers, I can't turn away in cowardice or shame from your need to prove the point of your blade's sentiment for a body's revision. You and your consort, this sharp-tongued brother, mean to break me, lave me down with its lipless kiss into the brother you wish you'd inherited. By the blade's argument, I am to be nobody or a new body, a new brother pulled from harm's kiln. Isn't that the glory of wounds? and the breakage of bones, their eagerness, I mean, to heal. What has harmed before becomes a science of fear. The body postured awkwardly in its attempt to avoid the same old errors, old behaviors. Go on then, school me on what blood is for. Yet no, my blade too has its claims on your body's hagiography. Now, it wants to question a tree down your face to mark your beauty. At the center of love is always buried a blade's head. So my book is so big that it has four title poems. So I'm gonna read all four. <clears throat> okay. 
Fantasia for the man in blue. You know good and well, you can't be out here in the dark morning to take in the moon, full as that bowl of light attached to this police cruiser. Like a great elephant shoots air through its trunk before it charges off to safety from a mouse in one of those old black and white cartoons, you shriek in a debutante's pitch, even though there are reports you are as large as an elephant. Car thefts in the area, the man in blue explains after he asks, where do you think you're going? It's unusual to see your kind walking at this hour. You're an elephant who's really just a man sweating away in a mascot's costume. You mumble an address. You fumble for an address that isn't your address, but mine. Oh, you've done it now. Don't say anything else. Let me take over this body. Soften what letters will bend. I am a poet after all. Don't worry, you'll see. He'll wish us a good morning and let us go after he bends us over the black hood. Fantasia for the man in blue. It's the great blue hero, elephant trunk hung, chewing the set and every man in it like the big star, a convincing replica in the distance video promises. He flashes before he flashes his long nightstick at hustlers and car thieves who know I want as much as you do now touching yourself, pretending the man in blue would bend over backwards to protect you from the boredom of your unremarkable penis. You get off on this, even, even when it isn't on screen in front of you, all in your head. Let's say you're a criminal. You fit the description. You did everything of which you are accused. Now, say there is a deal on the table. Then imagine that you're on the table. And like evidence, a bargain, if you let him, he swallows you, promises to forget the whole thing. Say you let him cuff you. Every address ending in sir, the way your father taught you. Fantasia for the man in blue. You know that painting, right? Matisse is Icarus. No, not so much a body to speak of, a darker suggestion, an absence of a body, an outline surrounded in blue. That's you, what you were. I can see fitting the description if you were not denied a face, arms perhaps tattooed with a lover's name, a mother's face, some evidence of having a life. And of your manhood, where is it? Either way, the blue has its way with you, its constellation of small destructions all around you, shell casings. No, not so much the shell, just the evidence of the shell. A bright wound where a heart can't possibly exist. Fantasia for the man in blue. What should you have expected? It's still dark at this hour. There is a star in the crest of his shield too small to shield a thing like the heart. You're like that Matisse painting of Icarus. You almost say before you realize it's all wrong. The colors all mixed up in your head. No. You are the disobedient one littering the spangled blue night with your dark tear. It's wrong to say this, you know, but the officer is so hot. You want to kiss him and run your fingers through his blonde hair. 
Sigh. Just look at the way the moon catches his metal. He shimmers like a handsome pistol. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tommy. A wonderful reading. Thank you. So next we have Brian Comey Dempster. His most recent book of poetry is Seas from Four Way Books. His debut book of poetry, Topaz, also from Four Way, received the 15 Bytes 2014 Book Award in Poetry. His poems have been published widely in the New England Review, North American Review, Plowshares, Triquarterly, and more including uh, Language for a New Century, Contemporary Poetry from the Middle East, Asia, and Beyond, and Asian American Poetry, The Next Generation. He's a professor of rhetoric and language at the University of San Francisco, where he serves as Director of Administration for the Master of Arts in Asia Pacific Studies program, and joining us from uh, California uh, today. And welcome, Brian. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Tommy, thank you for that gorgeous reading. It's beautiful work. I also want to give a shout out to Patricia and her new cat, Pearl. You want to hold up Pearl? <laughs> really cute cat. Um, while she holds up Pearl, a big warm thanks to Four Way Books, Martha, Ryan, Sally, Clarissa, Bridget, and everyone else. Really, really grateful to be with you. And then, of course, to family, friends, and others who are here today, we appreciate you being here. I'm going to read four poems today, and I'm going to try to give you sort of a cross-section, a sprinkling of what the book is about. I'm going to begin with the first poem, Seize, S-E-I-Z-E. -E. And this is an attempt to introduce the main characters and dramatic situation of the book which is really based upon a father and son, and in particular, parenting a child with special needs. Seas. Blue flame in the eye's corner, stove on high, we brace for his flint and spark, our dark surprise, his smile jolts, head unleashed, little body arch, straining in the high chair. We stand to face anything. She steadies his tray, eggs bubble in the pot. I lunge for his spoon, his purple elephant. Water boils over sides. We look to each other, sense the sizzle, his bowl clattering, a reverse crater, we shake off faults, shells crack, window shut. We smell the heat, hardened yolks, his brains singed gray, the scorched black dome. We are all hollowed out. One thing I've learned from parenting my incredible child, Brendan, is that when you have a child who's nonverbal, who has epilepsy, you're not as patient as you thought you were. You're not the father that you dream to be, but you also draw upon reserves of strength that you didn't know you had. And you appreciate little things, mundane things that you didn't know you would appreciate. Also, relationships become more complicated. This next poem, The Door, is about that. My partner Grace and I thought about having a second child after we had Brendan. And this poem addresses some of those conversations. It's called The Door. If I am not perfect, everything falls apart. I steady my epileptic son, pull the handle of the front door stuck, nowhere to go. Last night, I held Grace, entered her. Are you ready for another child, she asked. It could help us. Winter rain arrived, the night damp and cold. 
we slept together for the first time this week. Would the new child be normal? Protect or resent Brendan? Marriage is our son. Marriage is shutting him out. Turning my back, I kneel down, free the mat under the door. I am trying to get us somewhere. It slants open, a sliver of light. My pulse quickens, where did Brendan go? A crash behind me, his screams. I run to find him on the ground, his head bleeding. What are you doing? I yell at him, at myself. Calm down, Grace says, it's not his fault. We are closed in, she holds him tight. I reach a threshold, pull him back to me. Could I have been there? She touches my wrist. Can Grace and I get back to us? I sleep alone in the room next to his, listening. The strum of blinds, he'll stand up, sway on his bed, I'll rush in. Rain sweeps leaves from gutters, more nights apart. Grace's warmth beyond reach. Her words to me when he stopped crying. I'm close to wanting another. My face against her hair, it's apple scent. My words shutting her out, not quite yet. I am trying to stay open. So the book also explores other forms of seizure, not just medical, not just physical, but historical. This poem is about my mother who as an infant was incarcerated in Topaz, a Japanese American prison camp during World War II. And it is my attempt through her voice to articulate an experience that she doesn't remember except for in fragments. The reference to Tamfran is a, well, it's a detention center that was a holding site before they were taken to Topaz prison camp in Utah. And it's in San Bruno, California, for those of you from the West Coast. It's called My Mother and Tamfran. Horses live here with us, Mama told me. Straw scratched through, wings hovered above my nose. In the stall, I shuddered underfoot. Rope cinched around stomping legs, hooves running near. A wash of noise. There's what you think happened and what really happens. The horses were gone, my sister Taya tells me. Believe this, as a baby, I knew smells of manure, dirt flaked from my hair. Beneath spouts, I shivered, needles of ice poured on my skin. I sense it, hands swaddling me in coats, a tag with our prisoner number flapping against my face. Whinnies, moans behind boards. Shh, I kick the air. Flies scatter, people hide. The buzz stops, the ground quiets. Pretend we're horses. Mama's back, a bent saddle, I climb on. We gallop across mud, through gates, over fences, a dry green. I think we are far away.
Okay, thank you so much. To close the reading, I'm going to read a short poem. And I consider it my lullaby, my mantra to my son, Brendan. And it's called Sun Sutra, that's spelled S-O-N. And it's a double acrostic spelled Brendan down the left and Brendan down the right. And I don't know if anyone ever noticed that, to be honest. So I just had to point that out because I was so proud to write a double acrostic, very difficult. Okay, this is for my son, Brendan, Sun Sutra. Boy of stars, sun inside, fallen without a sob, rest against me, bending sunflower, still the flutter, Ease your head, son, it's late. No way to before your skull shadowed and sunlit. Turn, deepen us with your shadow words, muted son. Say, dad, after me, your scattered sun petals are sutra nightfall. I gather you, my bruised son. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Um, and congratulations on the on having uh, your son's name on the left, down the left and the right. So it's a it's a wonderful achievement. Thank you for sharing those poems with us. Um, so next uh, we have a. Elizabeth T. Gray Jr., whose long poem Salient was published by New Directions in May of this year. Her book length sequence of poems series, India, was published by Four Way Books in April of 2015. Other work has appeared in the Paris Review, Little, Little Star, Talisman, Paris Lit Up, and many others. And um, she is also a graduate of the uh, Warren Wilson MFA program, um, so another Asheville connection for us here. Um, and and uh, she um, is quite accomplished, uh, and, and we encourage you to check out the, the rest of her bio uh, online as well. Um, and uh, my pleasure to welcome Elizabeth. Hello. Thank you, Stephanie and Patricia. Such an awesome lineup tonight. It's such a pleasure, Tommy and Brian, hearing your work. Uh, it's been a while and it's just great. Um, so the pieces of poetry in Salient, uh, from which I'm going to read tonight, I think of as a single cloth, as a single poem. And so tonight I've picked a couple of threads out of it. The book was born by placing two poles of obsession in range of one another to see what happened. One was a battle uh, that happened in Flanders fields, in Belgian Flanders in 1917, um, which was just the poster child for the horrors of the First World War. Lots of mud and machine guns and artillery. And the second obsession um, are medieval texts of protective magic that were written in Tibet in the Middle Ages. So, because we don't have lots of time, it's hard for me to explain more about this, but trust me, it's, uh, there's an explanation in, in the book if you come across it. Anyway, the poems individually and collectively are some fusion of British military field manuals, Tibetan texts, and my own words and experience from spending time wandering the battlefields in Belgium. The book is largely focused on the missing, there were 90,000 soldiers who fought in the Ypres salient, this part of Belgian Flanders, whose bodies were never recovered or identified. Some of the poems are set in specific locations in the salient, and these are indicated by grid coordinates that were developed by the Royal Survey Corps in 1915. So the first poem is built from, as an illustrative example, <clears throat> specific orders that were issued on the 1st of October, 1917, 
to X Corps in Second Army, the 21st Division, 62nd Infantry Brigade. Preliminary orders. The two lead companies will advance as light as possible and thus will not carry shovels. Nothing superfluous will be taken. No greatcoats at zero. Wire is reported to be light. Bayonets will not be fixed if there is moonlight. Protecting walls must be built for the horses at once. The men may dig down or build walls for themselves. If the two lead companies advance as light, they will not need to advance as something else, as men or fodder or exhortation or as a dark wing that strains to unpin itself from wet ground. If in moonlight bayonets will not be fixed, they can remain fluid, imagining themselves as silver fear or unborn phosphor or even the wire out there that is also reported to be light. At zero, the warm, enormous horses will shrug their greatcoats behind protecting walls. Try to imagine that the men will not need to dig or build, but simply, as the flares and star shells do, advance as light. Harm. This poem is set in the salient just north of Railway Wood on map sheet 24 Northwest 4 Ypres. Harm. We are no longer confused about harm. Harm is in specific locations. I 5 D 9 1, for example, the small field 100 yards due east of Gully Farm. We strive to remain unattached without attraction or aversion to material forms. The way Phillips and Mercer did, who understood such distinctions. Most of them is still missing. Recalling the blah. Blah is the Tibetan word for soul. The blah or soul can also leave the body as a result of a frightening event or unbearable pain. In such cases, it may be recalled or ordered back by means of a ritual. The blah may dwell temporarily at least in various places outside the body without risk of any danger. Hence the expression Blana, dwelling of the soul, a place where the blah takes up residence. It can be a rock or tree, a pond, a small canal, or a piece of church. So, of course, each of the missing soldiers, all 90,000 of them, um, had loved ones at home. And after the war, they were not allowed to bring the bodies of their beloveds home. There were just too many of them. This poem is spoken by a woman in London addressed to her soldier. Stand to. Stand to was something the soldiers did at dawn and sunset, which is when attacks were likely to occur. Um, it meant sort of stand to attention, but it meant to stand on the fire step of the trench. Everybody was up, nobody was sleeping with their guns trained on no man's land waiting in case there was an attack. Stand to. Now that you have gone, you are forbidden to tell me where you are. I live on field service postcards, reverie, and the belief that we are inviolable and eternal and matter, the big vulnerable words. What I want are the soft parts of your body, where I stood watch at your flank alert, 
behind the warm berm of your rib, close as breath, looking out across at the blank expanse you would have to cross. When I think of you, my whole body says, fire. The guts of it. I think I would prefer to be killed in a railway accident, he said. Why? Because, well, there you are. But if you're killed by an exploding shell, he went on, then where the hell are you? Our bodies. Our bodies grew younger, pliant, light, like the 10 winds or cotton wool, changeless and radiantly luminous. We will be separated for just a moment. When I looked over my shoulder, a dense mist where there had been coral and turquoise. Your words were lies to me, but not to you. A promise incompletely informed, as we are when we make a vow, in earnest or the moment, all alloy of desire and blindness, suspended, all wish embedded in the apotropaic, the way the figure waits in clay, cooling slowly, assuming he will be released back to daylight intact by clearing parties or skilled craftsmen. My body may have felt like a lie to you, but not to me. Although there were lights in the dark air, falling slowly, illuminating the ground below where everything had stopped moving. When I looked over my shoulder, the dense mist separated for just a moment and there were our bodies, changeless and radiantly luminous. Your words begin to sound younger, pliant, light, like the 10 winds moving into the present. When I look over your shoulder, I see the ground as an alloy of fire and blindness, that we are separated for just a moment and a dense mist in which we are again coral and turquoise. I'm gonna finish with a, a poem for the season. There was early in the war, the, the war began in August of 1914 and Everyone thought it would be over by Christmas. When Christmas arrived, it was clear it was not going to be over anytime soon. It was clear the war didn't look like it, what anybody thought it was. And as some of you may have heard, at, on Christmas Eve, at various places along the Western Front, there was a spontaneous truce. The soldiers stopped firing at each other and sang Christmas carols. And then the next day they came out and exchanged gifts and cigarettes. Uh, once word got to headquarters that that was going on, there was a lot of artillery shelling and no more truce. That one time in December, 1914, the goddess came to the place of hell. And just by seeing her, the hell laborers delayed their torture work and sentient beings on both sides, all of us, were instantly freed from anger and the results of anger, such as the sufferings of rain and cold, hailstorms and broken sandbags and being pulled apart and chopped up. The burning ground became lapis lazuli and the hungry ghosts were sated, the animals no longer suffered, the demigods were no longer jealous of one another and the gods shredded all the maps. All needs and desires fell away like rain and the suffering of all sentient beings stopped, went silent and across the frozen ground between us, you could hear the carols. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to listen to you read. Um, really appreciate it, and and particularly evocative of some, you know, of, of real life um, that none of us were around to witness. But um, 
can kind of feel in those words. So thank you so much. So finally, um, we welcome Luke Hankins. Uh, and Luke is actually joining us uh, here in Asheville uh, as well. Uh, Luke is the author of two poetry collections, Radiant Obstacles and Weak Devotions, as well as a collection of essays, The Work of Creation. Volume of his translations from the French of Stella Radulescu, A Cry in the Snow and Other Poems was released by Seagull Books in 2019, 2019. And Hankins is the founder and editor of Orison Books, a nonprofit literary press focused on the life of the spirit from a broad and inclusive range of perspectives. Welcome, Luke. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and Malaprops and Four Way Books for uh, putting this event together and Malaprops for hosting. Uh, it's a great pleasure to read uh, with Tommy again. I've read with him in the past and his work is always stunning and moving and, uh, and as is the work of uh, Brian and Elizabeth, whom I haven't had the pleasure of uh, reading with before. So it's, it's just a great honor to be in such wonderful uh, and such um, um, accomplished company tonight. Uh, I thought I would open up with a couple uh, poems from A Cry in the Snow, my collection of translations. Um, Stella Benitsky Radulescu is a Romanian American poet. She um, grew up under the communist regime in Romania and uh, eventually was able to um, leave the country at the height of Ceausescu's uh, uh, communist dictatorship. And um, she actually writes in three languages, Romanian, French, and English, but she doesn't translate any of her own work between each language. So she's got a distinct body of work in each language and she doesn't want to translate her own work. So I have the privilege of translating her French poems into English. Um, I will uh, read a couple uh, short lyrics from her uh, uh, to begin. <clears throat> This is uh, called Adagio. A sound rises, a whiteness from the region of the heart, autumn of slow breath, stiff bones of light. The fires in the garden have died down. Cities of the past, sleeping cities. I was afraid of vowels, their paleness beneath the moon the night horses moving away at a trot. No, it's not a word, not yet, this vapor escaping the mouth. And I apologize for that. Uh, a, um, this is actually the title poem, A Cry in the Snow. At the brim of night, a fire leaps up, an arm gestures to me. My presence seems to make the roses tremble in the garden and make the birds rise up and make the earth shake. The streets lengthen, the shadow of an infinite word haunts the minutes, haunts the hours. I want to remain silent but my cry attaches itself to a sliver of light. The snow covers it with its suffocating coolness, a loving gesture before the cold in the burning mouth. That's a little taste of Stella Nitsky Radulescu. Um, I will read a few short, uh, recent poems, newer than um, what's in my book that came out this year, Radiant Obstacles. And then I'm going to read one poem from, from the book. Um, this is called Category Error. Hummingbirds are fighting over the flowers in the garden again, because beauty doesn't make anything immune to cruelty. Imagine a world in which each beautiful creature could be trusted 
And isn't each creature beautiful? The sleek, streaked coat of the tiger, the iridescent scales of the snake, and the shockingly blue eyes of the shooter on the evening news. This is a poem uh, for my dad called Hum. Though we were poor at touch as a family, my father would blow on my face to cool me in the heat of Louisiana summers, upstairs in church where he ran the soundboard. It was the sweetest shock, as if the Holy Ghost had swept straight through me, leaving my spine full of static. His breath hums in me still. And uh, last of the newer poems, this is a poem called My Name, and it has an epigraph from Dennis Johnson's poem, Now, uh, a line from the poem, which reads, Darkness, my name is Dennis Johnson. So this is my name. Darkness, my name is Luke, and that means light. So it can't be near. You've banished it. Darkness, what is your name? You so envelop it within the folds of your being that I'll never reach it. You swallow me, but not deeply enough. My name is a pillar of fire I remember but cannot see. Darkness, swallow me, swallow me. I hear you are a gateway. Prove it. Then I'll end with one uh, slightly longer poem uh, from the beginning of Radiant Obstacles called Val. This one also has an epigraph. This is from uh, the, uh, I suppose you call her a philosopher, uh, Elaine Scarry, uh, who wrote, Beauty brings copies of itself into being. This is vow. I have made no vow of undying love, except to moments like this one, as water flames out, flung from the dog bowl over the hydrangea leaves, a sunlit wing extended and sparkling for a bare moment before it collapses into the earth the very Icarus of beauty. Why is it so tempting to say the love of a thing is dependent on its loss? Is this the temptation into which God fell when she made these ants crawling across my open book, intricate mechanisms that will live a few weeks? How can God bear to bring so much into being in her zeal to create, saying it is good, it is good at each genesis, only to let it all so quickly die? Beauty brings copies of itself into being, says the philosopher. So the queen ant produces brood after brood, sends her grotesque offspring, each animate replica, into the world to work before succumbing to the common fate of every spark. So the artist tries to record the moment water was fanned in air and lit like the appendage of a transparent bird hovering over the hydrangea leaves. So a mosquito bites a stray dog and heartworm larvae enter its bloodstream, settle and grow in its heart before sending their own larvae into the blood to be transported through a mosquito to the next post. So beauty brings copies of itself into being. And who are we to say the water in flight, the ant, the artist, the work of art, the mosquito, the dog, and the heartworms are not equally beautiful to God, who experiences the birth and life and death of each being and event simultaneously. 
Does she suffer as she rejoices? Is she consoled by the successive generations of her creation? I could not presume to know the maker's mind, but I know something of my own. I could not bear to make such magnificent and fleeting things. But being here, having been brought briefly into being, I gather in my mind the moments I glimpse a marvelous life or witness a startling arrangement of matter. Though these things all pass away, I vow to harbor them until, like heartworms, they bring so many copies of themselves into being, I die of it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you for sharing um, your your new work with us too. Um, that's that that always feels feels very special uh, when we get to hear work that that isn't in a, in a published book yet. So thank you for thank you for sharing those with us. And um, so I I just want to end by um, again thanking everyone so much. I, I when Tommy finished up, I, I felt a little. Uh, speechless actually and <laughs> um and um i just wanted to, i meant to say directly congratulations to you on, the, on being a national book award finalist it's really well deserved um and so yes round of applause uh, for that um and uh, and thank you for missing malachi <laughs> we hope to <laughs> we hope to see you uh, you know back in the store. We hope to see everyone back in the store um, at some point. Um, so it's just been such a pleasure to uh, share this virtual space with everyone this evening. We're so grateful to everyone who has joined us in the audience. We we know that there are lots of demands on everyone's time. So we really appreciate you being here. And of course, we're most grateful to our poets this evening uh, for being with us, to Tommy and Brian and Elizabeth and Luke. Um, and I do want to give you all um, the opportunity if you have um, any parting words that you would like to share before we end. Uh, and we'll start with Tommy again. Uh, no pressure though. Oh, let me, there you go. Unmute it. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh gosh, parting words. I am so not good at this. Um, I guess I, I, I always, I, I always want to tell people, especially now, um, it's like, it's now is the prime time to, um, to, to be gracious with one another, to be um, generous with one another. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's what I want to say. That's Perfect. it. Perfect. Yeah, thank that's you. That's the tweet. <laughs> 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 and it's and it's a perfect one. Thank you, Tommy. Brian. Well, first off, I just want to thank Tommy and. Luke and Elizabeth for their beautiful work. It was actually very inspiring to be here today and to listen to them. And also to Malaprop, stores like you matter so much. And we're so honored to read with you today. I echo Tommy's idea of gratitude. I think the election is over and there was a sigh, an exhale. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's still so much more to come, and I think we're all living virtually, and it's so important to be together like this and to have these types of events to feel a sense of community. So as we head toward the new year, um, I say gratitude, I say love, I say peace, and I say togetherness. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Thanks so much. Elizabeth? Well, I... I think I'll just pile on. Um, you know, I am always happy to have people come and hear me read, but I have been very inspired tonight listening to these other readers. 
and I am coming to you tonight live, despite my background, which is a street in Tehran, uh, from New York City, mm -hmm. and having been here all spring, um, and knowing what it looks like when it gets bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to echo what Tommy's saying. You took the words right out of my mouth. It was like, everyone you meet is having a hard time. They may not look it. They may look like they're having a better time than you are, but nobody is not struggling. Mm -hmm. And I do think just be patient, be kind, you know, hard as that is when we're all stressed beyond belief. Um, but, you know, thank you, Patricia and Stephanie, for convening this little moment of, you know, warmth as a dark winter comes upon us. Um, it's been a particularly bad year personally in my extended family. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to getting this year gone and send you blessings. Stay safe. We New Yorkers know that if you must do that. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's, that's very important. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. And oh, don't thank you. On this virus. We know what yeah. happens if you're not paying attention. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for, for being with us and, um, and, and know that I, you know, I think there are lots of hearts with, with you and, and sort of with each other uh, in this moment. And thank you so much. Um, and then, and then Luke, we'll, we'll back to you. Um, I think I'd like to say that um, now is the time and has been the time to make something out of the strangeness and the physical disconnect we're all feeling. This is going to sound ironic uh, in a Zoom event, but get off the screen when you can get off the screen. Get into your body, go deep into yourself, make something. You write, write with a pen or a quill, <laughs> full physical paper. If you paint, you make ceramics. If you make music, you know, touch your medium. Get in touch with your own body, center yourself in your being and appreciate physicality when and where you can. Uh, make what you can out of this strange disconnected time. It's a time that we're going to come out of more resilient, more connected to our, uh, our own sense of being and sense of purpose. I truly believe that. So take advantage of it. Thank you all. Thank you, Luke. So just thank you all so much again um, it, for leaving us uh, with, with those thoughts of gratitude and grace and resilience and creativity and care. Um, we need to take care of ourselves and take care of each other at this time. Um, and so I, I hope that events like these um, achieve that in a small way, you know, um, just in allowing us to, to um, again, to share, share space and energy with each other. So thank you so much. It's been such a such a pleasure uh, to be with you all this evening. We so appreciate it. We hope to see y'all again in whatever form that may take. Um, uh, and until then, please do stay safe and stay well. Um, and yes, looking forward to a new year <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so um, welcoming 2021 pretty soon. Um, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>